session. This lecture will be delivered by S. Subramanian, National Fellow, Indian Council of Social Science Research, New Delhi. Can I please request the speaker to come on stage? The session will be chaired by Amit Khare, Development Commissioner, Government of Jharkhand. Can I also request the chair to come on stage? The topic for this session is Money Metric Poverty and the Possibility of a Guaranteed Basic Income for India. We have about 30 minutes for the speaker, followed by question and answer. Can I please request the chairperson to take over the proceedings? Good afternoon. It is indeed a privilege for me to welcome here and introduce our speaker, Professor Subramaniam, who in fact needs no introduction. He has been National Fellow of ICE, ESSR, Professor of Madras Institute of Development Studies. The topic that he has chosen for us <coughs> is indeed of great interest particularly the possibility of a guaranteed basic income that we have been talking about. It has come in the economic survey 2017. I think it will be a very, very useful session, not only for the academics, but also for the policy planners who are present here. Since uh, we have restriction of time because the valedictory session has to start at 4.30, Without much ado, I will request Professor Subramanian. First, I'd like to say that it's very nice to have been invited to deliver this lecture on the occasion of our 25th anniversary. I'm sure I wish, wish the institution all the very best in the time to come. Uh, I just discovered that the uh, PowerPoint presentation I've sent hasn't actually been uploaded, so I'm afraid I'm going to be somewhat handicapped by that, but we'll try and do the best that we can. There's no serious problem after all. At the outset, I must indicate that what I'm about to present is based on a paper written in collaboration with my friend and former colleague at the Madras Institute of Development Studies, Professor D. Jayaraj. The lecture I'm going to present is concerned to make three points about money-metric poverty in India. First, that the standard poverty line approach to measuring poverty considerably understates poverty and that the particular protocols by which India's official poverty lines are determined are arbitrary and misleading. Second, that the view of poverty in which the achievement of a satisfactory level of income is seen as a valuable end in itself, and which is captured in something like Kaushik Basu's quintile income statistic, suggests a high order of income poverty in the country, 
which belies the relatively encouraging trends exhibited by headcount ratios based on official poverty lines. And third, that the continued coexistence of large amounts of poverty with large amounts of inequality needs to be redeemed by some deliberate redistributive strategy aimed at providing something like a guaranteed basic minimum income to every citizen of the, of the country. Some of the limitations of this talk need emphasizing. We, and when I say we, I mean my co-author and I, have been led to the welfare-related appeal of a basic universal income and of direct redistributive income taxation as a means to this end from our own long prior preoccupation with issues pertaining to the conceptualization and measurement of poverty. It is this latter perspective, rather than any remote expertise in the nuances of basic income studies or public finance, which presides over this presentation. So what we advance is the beginning of an idea, not anything like a detailed roadmap to implementation and delivery. It is an aspect of one approach to what might, in principle, be done to alleviate monometric poverty and not a blueprint to that end. Let me begin with a quick and elementary tour de raison of the possible case for a universal basic income. An important recent book on the subject in the Indian context is the one by Dawala, Jabwala, Mehta and Standing, on which I shall draw considerably. Here are some plausible arguments espousing the cause of a UBI, or universal basic income. One, unlike means-tested transfers, which tend to be paternalistic and charitable, UBI strengthens the notion of economic citizenship by stressing universalism, rights-based entitlements, social justice, autonomy in decision-making, and freedom. Two, UBI limits bureaucrats' discretionary power and the attendant corruption and clientelism, which are so much a feature of targeted anti-poverty programs. Three, UBI is relatively efficient, as reflected, for example, in the low administrative costs of income transfers that have been observed in Mexico. Four, in contrast to targeted conditional transfers, UBI is relatively more effective in reducing poverty and poverty traps by ensuring better knowledge and greater take up of the benefits of the program among the poor, and also greater participation in income generating activities. Five, UBI promotes human development by promoting school attendance and the use of healthcare facilities while reducing child malnutrition, school, school dropout rates, child labor, and gender differentials and developmental attainments. Six, and in general, UBI improves health and nutrition outcomes. Seven, UBI is conducive to the empowerment of women in terms of facilitating a measure of freedom for them from both abusive men and exploitative employers. The many objections to UBI would include the following. First, UBI is seen as a smokescreen for dismantling all public welfare systems. However, many advocates of UBI are committed to strengthening existing programs and see UBI as one component of a larger welfare system, and I shall return to this theme. Second, UBI transfers are objected to as unjustifiable handouts. A counter that may be entered to this objection is, at the philosophical level, that one must question the justice of an arrangement in which, as Dawala et al. put it, quote, wealthy people obtain numerous benefits without being required to give something in return, unquote. Now, and this is an outcome that might be corrected by a UBI when it is seen as what Thomas Paine called a social dividend on the investment of previous generations to which all are entitled. The third objection is an incentive-related one which views UBI as promoting laziness and negatively impacting on the labor market participation of recipients. Galbraith's response argues for an acceptance of the reasonableness of allowing some leisure for the poor too. But apart from this, there is empirical evidence available against the proposition from both India and Namibia. The fourth objection is the claim that UBI will have leakages to which Dawala et al. post the counter that, to the contrary, quote, direct cash transfers would reduce the number of steps required for the benefit to reach the recipient and would considerably reduce the possibility of siphoning off funds from into illeg illegitimate hands, unquote. The fifth objection calls the effectiveness of UBI into question in the presence of supply-side constraints. Citing case studies from Brazil and Namibia, Dawala et al. argue that transfer schemes under UBI tend to create their own supplies, 
as reflected in improvements to education and medical clinics in response to increased demand for such services. So this quick summary suggests, at the very least, that it is possible to make a well-founded case for and a well-founded case against the objections to a universal basic income. The truth of the matter is that one supposes that both targeted, means-tested targeted programs and universal, universal cash transfer schemes have their respective places in the scheme of things. I mean, some, some programs necessarily have to be targeted. Maternity benefits at the least have to be targeted to women. Old age pension has to be targeted to senior citizens and so on. So we can't escape targeting altogether. And there are other contexts in which UBI uh, must be seen to be the preferred alternative. But having said that, how important for the purposes of the present le lecture is the possibility that the claims and counterclaims vis-a-vis -vis UBI may not be conclusive. Now, the relative merits of UBI and other forms of welfare intervention assume salience, typically, when we have a fixed and limited budget that allows for choosing only the one or the other form of intervention. In the present exploration of the possibility of a UBI for India, I suggest that the choice between UBI and means-tested grants is not necessarily one that needs to be addressed. I take the view that a UBI is feasible without compromising other existing welfare programs. This is not a fiscally irresponsible statement to make if it can be shown that additional resources which do not entail reductions in budgetary provisions for other necessary and existing welfare schemes can be found. Two avenues which are explored of mobilizing additional revenues to finance the UBI for India are through morphing up unaccounted income in the economy and through savings that can be effected by withdrawing various tax exemptions and concessions which are presently available to the affluent. To state one's position explicitly, I advance the case for a universal guaranteed basic income for all citizens in India, in addition to all existing welfare schemes for the poor, many of which, of course, need to be revamped, rationalized, and made altogether less leaky. Though this is a subject we do not need to explore in this lecture, given that we are speaking of supplementation rather than apportionment of the existing budget. Let me now deal with some of the limitations of the standard money metric approach to poverty measurement, which is what leads on to, among other things, which is what leads on to the case for a universal basic income. The measurement procedure most widely resorted to in assessing money metric poverty is what one may describe as the identification come aggregation procedure. This consists in first identifying the poor by reference to a poverty line and the distribution of incomes into a numerical representation of poverty, such as typically the headcount ratio of poverty. Underlying this procedure is a view of income as a means to an end. The poverty line in this perspective is, or at least should be, the amount of income needed in order to avoid deprivation in respect of the attainment of minimally satisfactory levels of certain states of being and doing, such as nutrition, shelter, knowledge, and mobility, which Amartya Sen called elementary human functionings. For reasons of both individual and environmental or contextual heterogeneities, one should expect that there will be interpersonal variations in the ability to convert it income or more broadly resources into functionings. This is why a unique money metric poverty line which negates these heterogeneities must be seen to be seriously misconceived. More generally, when one adopts the language of a poverty line, one implicitly endorses or should endorse invariance of the poverty standard in the space of functionings, not resources. This is what led Amartya Sen again to the formulation that poverty is sensibly seen as an absolute concept in the space of functionings, but because of interpersonal variations in the conversion rates of resources into functionings as a relative concept in the space of incomes or resources in general. The World Bank, however, in terms of its dollar-a-day poverty line, endorses invariance of the poverty norm in the space of real incomes, that is, income adjusted only for price variations, while official Indian approaches to the poverty line have endorsed invariance of the poverty norm in the space of commodity bundles. The poverty line approach to measuring poverty has thus attended 
to reflect a somewhat incoherent tension between theory and practice. In principle, the poverty line is supposed to be a means in the space of income to achieve the end of avoiding deprivation in the space of functionings. In fact, it has been employed as an often arbitrarily specified end in itself. This is an abuse of both language and logic. An additional complication is the so-called calorie drift, which I will describe very briefly in the following terms. Typically, one might expect, as one moves forward in time, that consumer preferences will shift differentially in favor of non-food items of consumption, such as education, health, and transport, vis-a-vis -vis food items. This would be compatible with overtime calorific consumption at the officially prescribed poverty lines, progressively falling short of the stipulated nutritional norms. In the Indian context, this phenomenon has indeed been observed and come to be called the calorie drift. Such a drift implies equivalently that the real poverty line might be expected over time to lie further and further above the officially determined poverty line, which is based on calorie consumption. A further difficulty in the Indian context is the absolute lowness of the poverty line. The poverty line for rural India in 2011-12 at current prices is of the order of about Rs. 650 per person per month, according to the Lakrawala Expert Group, around Rs. 816 according to the Tendulkar Expert Group, and about Rs. 972 according to the Rangarajan Expert Group. As we can see, the allowance for a decent standard of living made by each successive expert committee has increased over time. Even so, does even the most generous of these allowances approximate its intended interpretation of a level of income that permits a modest level of freedom from want? Recall that a reasonable interpretation of the term poverty line is compatible with the requirement of the following type. One first lists a set of elementary human functionings in respect of which a person must attain minimally satisfactory levels of achievement in order to be deemed free of deprivation. One costs the attainment of each of these levels of functioning, and one adds up these costs, while avoiding the sins of double counting and the like, in order to arrive at the poverty line. To what extent have official Indian proposals for the poverty line met this requirement? By way of an illustrative example, consider the Langarajan Committee's urban poverty line for the state of Tamil Nadu, from which I come, for 2011-12, uh, which at current prices works out to about Rs. 1,380 per person per month. Um, employing the consumer price index of industrial workers, one can update this poverty line to its value at 2013-14 prices, which very roughly is Rs. 1,600 or Rs. 8,000 for a family of five. Confining ourselves to necessities relating to nutrition, shelter, education, and health, we have ourselves attempted to come up with a quick estimate of a monthly poverty line income for a household of five in 2014. I do not spell out the details, but they are available should anyone, anyone be curious enough to want them on request. Uh, and our poverty line works out to about rupees 14,000, which is far in excess of the official poverty line of rupees 8,000. This view is supported by Marx's suggestion that the socially necessary means of subsistence is always, quote, practically known, unquote. I invite you to consider if a monthly threshold of rupees 14,000 for a family of five is extravagant from what you know of living in urban India. In what follows and in the light of the foregoing, I consider an approach to the quantification of monumental poverty which is arguably less vulnerable to conceptual incoherence and the temptations of manipulation than has proved to be the case with the poverty line approach to the problem in India. As argued earlier, the language of a monumetric poverty line ought to connote a resource-based threshold, which is derived from a capability or functioning-based perspective of deprivation. However, as long as we are clear about our intentions, without resorting to Humpty Dumptyism in the use of language, there should be nothing illegitimate about reckoning monumetric poverty by viewing income as an end in itself, rather than only contingently as a means to the end of avoiding deprivation in functioning space. In this view, monumetric poverty is simply a matter of the lowness of income. The lower one's income, the greater one's level of income poverty. Monumetric poverty, that is, can be deduced by appraising the income status of the income poorest section of any population. 
It is in line with this understanding that one advances Kaushik Basu's quintile income statistic, as he referred to it, as an indicator of moneymetric poverty, pure and simple. The quintile income statistic is just the average income of the income poorest 20% of a population. It is what a philosopher might call a moneymetric poverty indicator simplicity. It is easily discernible from distributional data on consumption expenditure available in the National Sample Survey Office's uh, publications that the quintile expenditure levels in India reflect acutely low standards of living. Our attempt at deriving a poverty line for urban Tamil Nadu earlier is suggestive of the possibility that a monthly norm of adequacy for a family of five might be of the order of rupees 14,000 for the country. In contrast, the average consumption expenditure for a family of five in the poorest quintile is just around rupees 3,000 in the rural areas and rupees 4,200 in the urban areas in India in 2011-12, which itself reflects an improvement in however weak a trend over the performance in earlier years. What of the hiatus between the richest and poorest sections of the population in terms of the ratio of the richest to poorest groups' average consumption levels? In rural India, this ratio is roughly constant in the period 83 to 93, 94, and then rises gradually in the period 2004, 5 to 2011, 12. In urban India, the rise is a, is a systematic right through, gradually in the period 83 to 2004, 05, and steep thereafter. Over the entire period from 1983 to 2011, 12, in the rural areas, the average consumption level of the poorest 100 million has grown at an annual compound rate of 2.48%, while the average consumption level of the richest 100 million has grown at 3.43%. The corresponding figures for urban India, the poorest 50 million and the richest 50 million respectively, are even starker at 1.91% and 3.94%. The poorest sections of the population have improved their condition more slowly, systematically, than the richest sections. In summary, if we take the achievement of a decent level of income or consumption as a valuable functioning in itself, then by focusing attention on the consumption poorest section of the population, we find that levels of consumption deprivation are very high, that such deprivation has been relatively poorly served by the process of growth, notwithstanding the improvements in the latter registered in the post-liberalization period, and that growth has been relatively more beneficial to the richer sections of the population so that the phenomenon of monumetric poverty has been accompanied by growing monumetric inequality as well. This strongly suggests a need for something in the nature of an explicit income redistribution remedy designed to shore up the faltering fortunes of the income poorest sections of the population through the mechanism of a guaranteed basic income. And it is to this issue that I now now turn. In the coexistence of severe income poverty with growing income inequality, Perhaps the most glaring inequity on view is the burgeoning size of the unaccounted economy. In December 2013, a report on the estimated size of the unaccounted economy was submitted to the Government of India by the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. And since then, there has been a change in the central government. But till date, the Finance Ministry has not released the NIPFP document into the public domain, despite many clamorous promises that were made as part of its earlier election mandate to mop, to mop up unaccounted incomes. In a press leak reported in the August 14th, 2014 issue of the National Daily, The Hindu, we find that the NIPSP report estimates that, quote, India's black economy could now be nearly three-fourths the size of its reported gross domestic product, GDP, unquote. What if a part of the unaccounted money circulating in the Indian economy were to be employed to finance a guaranteed basic minimum income for the citizens of the country. The underlying arithmetic of such a proposal is explored in an admittedly crude fashion in what follows. Suppose to begin with that each person in the country were guaranteed a minimum income of rupees 20 a day, or rupees 600 per month, or rupees 7,200 per month, or what comes to the same thing, rupees 3,000 per family of five per month. Given a 2011 population size of 1,210 million, the aggregate countrywide budget for the guaranteed income for 2011 would be around rupees 8,712 billion, which is 
7,200 per capita, multiplied by the population of 1,210 million, or rounding off to something like rupees 8,700 billion, where 1 billion connotes 1,000 million. Let us now assume that the unaccounted economy is less than one half of the 75% of national GDP reported in the news item which I mentioned earlier. Specifically, let us suppose that this figure is pegged at just 33%. Suppose further that the government mops up 30% of this unaccounted money as legitimate tax payable to the exchequer. We are speaking then of a figure which is 9.9%, that is 30% of 33% of GDP. The GDP at factor cost for India in 2011-12 was Rs. 88,300 billion, and 9.9% .9 of that figure works out to Rs. 8,742 billion, or rounding off to Rs. 8,700 billion, which was precisely the budget that I pointed out was required to fund a guaranteed income of Rs. 600 per person per month. Now, employing the distribution of consumption expenditure as a proxy for the distribution of income, by remembering that inequality in the latter it would be much greater than in the former, we can generate, as in this table, a schedule of taxes for each ventile of the population for the year 2011-12. The table is to be read as follows. Column 1 provides information on ventile specific per capita earned income and is obtained by, um, by applying the ventile specific consumption expenditure share computed from National Sample Survey data on consumption expenditure distribution to the aggregate GDP of Rs. 88,300 billion in 2011-12. It seems reasonable to conjecture that any unaccounted income in the system is generated only by the richest decile of the population. Accordingly, we have added the estimated unaccounted income in the economy, 33% of GDP, to the estimated accounted income of the two richest ventiles, and apportion the unaccounted income between these two ventiles in proportion to their respective consumption shares. As we've seen earlier, the annual national bill of a guaranteed basic income scheme of rupees 600 per person per month is rupees 8,712 billion, which works out a 7.42% of the aggregate black income inflated GDP. Column two of the table furnishes information on the ventile specific per capita tax liability that would arise from a uniform application of a tax rate of 7.42% on all incomes. That's the second column. Column four gives data on each ventile's post-tax income per capita, while column six provides ventile-specific information on post-tax come transfer income per capita, obtained from adding the guaranteed per capita basic income of rupees 7,200 to each ventile's post-tax per capita income. That's right, but please do give me my allotted time. Okay. I should be allowed at least my allotted time. Otherwise, I mean, I'm perfectly happy to just drop everything at this stage. Uh, I've only spoken for 20 minutes. I've been observing the watch quite closely. Do I continue or what? What do you want me to do? To just call, call this to an end? I'm perfectly happy to do that if that's what you want me to do. We have time, Madam Dev. Okay, but I really believe this should be attended with a little more seriousness. Anyway, that's, that's what you want. Uh, well, the moral of the lesson is that apparently, judging from these figures, in principle, it is possible uh, uh, to have a guaranteed basic minimum income program for the country. Let me just conclude, uh, because anyway, my spirit has gone out of this whole thing. Uh, I've been concerned to make three points about money metric poverty in India. First, the measurement of poverty, which is based on an identification come aggregation approach to the problem, is based in principle but seldom in practice on the understanding that the poverty line in, in income terms represents the amount of income needed in order to achieve some basic necessities of life in the space of human functionings. The poverty line, that is, is supposed to be interpreted as a means to the end of achieving freedom from capability deprivation. This supposition, unfortunately, is often observed only in the breach Poverty lines, such as India's official thresholds or the World Bank's global poverty cutoffs, are out of joint with any reasonable conception of adequacy in forming these norms. I have provided an illustrative example in which a poverty line for urban Tamil Nadu, derived from some rough but common sense assumptions about adequacy, is shown to be far in excess of Indian official and World Bank poverty lines. 
magnitudes and trends of poverty based on the latter type of poverty lines are argued to be fundamentally misleading. An alternative view of money-metric poverty sees income as an end in itself. It views the attainment of a satisfactory level of income as a valued human functioning in and of itself. In such an interpretation, money-metric poverty can be usefully assessed by focusing attention on the income achievements of the poorest sections of our population. One operationalization of this approach would be to track the magnitudes and trends in the average income of the poorest X percent of a population or of the poorest X million persons of a population. An application of such an exercise to the Indian data suggests that the problem of money-metric poverty is still an acute one. The poor in India still have very low absolute levels of income, and while these have been raised by the process of growth, the latter has been much more beneficial for the richer than for the poorer sections of the population. The situation of large amounts of absolute income poverty that obtains in India alongside rising levels of income inequality should be a cause of considerable moral disquiet and practical anxiety, uh, not necessarily in all fora, but I would argue that yes. In this context, the lecture has advanced the scheme of a modest guaranteed basic income for every citizen of the country to be financed by placing some elementary curves on the inequity of unlawful tax evasion by the rich or removing tax concessions to the affluent. Our computations are admittedly undefined, and clearly many pragmatic issues of design and implementation require a great deal more careful attention than we have devoted to them. Our objective really has been the modest one of suggesting a preliminary and tentative approach to addressing the problem, which no doubt will benefit greatly from further careful and nuanced examination. In the meantime, it is our firm conviction that the continued neglect of some elementary redistributive measures aimed at reducing both poverty and inequality would be seriously unwise, even if from considerations only of enlightened self-interest and not justice. Thank you. Professor Gupta, do we have 10 minutes time for further discussion? Break a little bit and uh, we can continue to discuss. Okay, they don't want us here. Let us take the questions. Please, sir. Thank you very much for that wonderfully rich paper which I look forward to reading. I come from outside your playing field and uh, still we dabble with poverty. I'm talking about survey research and political science analysis. Um, I would like to have your opinion on how we formulate poverty measurement and uh, whether we are getting it right or wrong. Um, first of all, in survey research, we do not any longer ask about income because in the individual income is difficult to measure and often, particularly in the informal sector, there is uh, no concept of individual income. It's much more family income, and families are very extended, complicated uh, organizations. So we talk about possession of enduring goods, like have you got a roof, and have you got this, have you got that, or a scooter or a bicycle, that's one way. The other is a subjective dimension. We would ask, uh, do you consider yourself to be poor? Now, that comes from um, the work of uh, Dave Robert Gurr and other people who have talked about relative deprivation. So there, poverty measurement is not so much a measurement of income, but the sense of having a gap between what you think is legitimately yours and what you actually earn. Um, so those are the two poverty measurements with which we track down the poor in order to measure the implications of poverty for political attitudes, voting preferences, and so on. So uh, I'd be grateful for your opinion. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk, very serious matter, as you said. Um, in addition to linking the argument for universal basic income to uh, functionings and capability arguments, do you consider that the poor have a higher discount rate of the future and that therefore the key objective is to change their time preference behavior and that the universal basic income, the argument for it, 
is that it contributes to the change in the time preference behavior of the poor by giving them a platform of security. By giving them? A platform of security. Last question from the back. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, we try to advance the view that uh, poverty measurement in India is under, you know, uh, needs to be updated and, and, and probably we, uh, we require a higher poverty line. There is a view among some section of the economists that wherever you draw a poverty line in India, over the last 20 decades, poverty would have fallen. Uh, you know, I mean, based on, you know, your poverty measurement, uh, have you sort of looked at trends in the poverty rate and, you know, do you sort of agree or, you know, disagree with that sort of view? Uh, about um, this temporal dimension of poverty uh, in the last 20 decades, uh, in, uh, in the last 20 years, for instance. Thanks. Okay, I'll answer the questions as quickly as I can. Uh, your question, yes, uh, again, without going into nuances or subtleties, if our understanding of deprivation is mediated, as I believe it should, by a view of human capabilities and functionings, then the way in which we measure deprivation must conform to that conceptualization. And in that context, there is already a great deal of work which has been done on what is called multidimensional poverty measurement. Now, given the fact that there is a way of reckoning poverty directly in functioning space, despite the fact that the process of aggregation has a number of problems associated with it, there is nevertheless more than working room available for assessing deprivation directly in functioning space. Given that, it seems to be very odd to speak of money metric poverty, which remember is the title of my paper, again in terms of functionings. If you're going to be able to measure deprivation directly, in multi-dimensional functioning space, there is no reason for you to replicate that exercise with a great deal of imperfection in the bargain by speaking of a poverty line, which in the end doesn't even end up doing its assigned job. Okay. So, uh, briefly, I'm in sympathy with, with, with what you say. And uh, much of this also flows out, out of the work of people like Townsend and uh, Morris and uh, uh, Atkinson, and of course, Seth himself. Uh, on on uh, uh, the tendency to discount uh, 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 the future more heavily among the poor, that must be expected to be the ha to, 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 be, to be the case when the rate of time preference is uh, inversely related to endowments. So you are right. I mean, uh, and uh, there is every case therefore. I mean, the kind of uh, universal basic income scheme that I'm speaking of is one which in terms of outcome is progressive, but which guarantees the same basic income for every uh, citizen of the country. Uh, there is obviously a case for uh, having a differentiated scheme of uh, incomes, which includes things like the provision of basic security to those whose rates of time preference are uh, higher than those of others. Uh, on, on this argument that no matter what poverty line you choose, uh, you find that uh, secular data in India display a reduction in poverty. Now, uh, technically, this is referred to as first order stochastic dominance. So if the cumulative distribution function of income for, for one distribution lies somewhere below and nowhere above that of the other distribution, then uh, you infer that no matter what poverty line you choose, poverty has declined. I think this is a fundamentally flawed line of reasoning, although it, ha it has it has garnered a great deal of respect in the technical literature and poverty measurement because you are constraining the poverty analyst to employ exactly one poverty line for each comparison. Whereas if you were to take uh, a more realistic functionings oriented view of poverty, you might have a larger poverty line for a subsequent period of time than for the previous period of time. In, in which case, first order stochastic dominance is going to be of absolutely no avail in uh, uh, coming up with what is widely regarded as an unambiguous judgment on poverty declines.
Thank you, Professor Subramanya. I really wish we had more time for discussion, particularly the concept of UBI, which has come. I think it's very, very important for the policy makers also. Yes. Both. But unfortunately,